So we are going to cover the principle of objective. The principle of, we could say, of the objective. You must have an objective in spiritual warfare. There's a purpose. Remember, a lot of spiritual warfare is taught from the point of view of uh, we're under attack, we're under siege, and the enemy's doing this, and what's he doing? No, no, we have to remember, we're the victors. We're on the attack, right? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That means hell is under siege, not the church. We're on the move. Amen? And if you're going to be on the move, you've got to have an objective. You've got to have a purpose. You've got to have something you're going after in particular. And you should go from objective to objective. Never be without an objective. This would also apply in modern times. We would call this a goal even. You, you need to have a goal. Short term, long term, mid term, all that. You need to have goals that you're moving toward. Uh, so this would fall under that category. Now, the definition of the principle of objective means to define a decisive an attainable objective for every, quote-unquote, military spiritual warfare operation. <clears throat> Pursue one great decisive aim with force and determination. See, again, what you're going to see over and over and over again in this is this. Too many Christians have settled for complacency through passivity. And the reason is, it's easy. You don't have to do anything. You just kind of kick back, and, and that's why a lot of the, um, more along the lines of, of like a, a Calvinistic sovereignty kind of thing. I know I've already mentioned that a little bit, but it's pretty much, well, you know, it's all God's will. Whatever happens is God's will, so there you go, so why, why do anything? Well, if that were true, I would agree with that, right? But it's not true, because we are told to do things, right? So, uh, notice in every war, every battle, every great endeavor... There must be clear, specific goals and objectives. Each person who is responsible for a part of the result must know exactly what the desired results are and how they are to be measured. The greater the degree of clarity, the more likely it is that the goal will be achieved. Right? So no fuzzy goals. Right? You need clarity. You need to know specifically. Uh, you need to know exactly what is, what you're doing, when, why, who's taking part. Uh, matter of fact, in, uh, in the military, they actually have a warning order that goes into all these things. And it talks about the, the terrain, the, the weather, the people, the, the equipment, everything that has to do with it. And so, now, if churches operated that way, you'd be surprised at how much faster they would advance the gospel. But then, of course, then you've got some people. Here's the thing. The people, the groups, okay, you got two different groups. You got people that don't believe really much of anything spiritual, and most Christianity to them is just natural, uh, you know, no gifts, no power, no healings, no, you know, no, I don't want to say no God in it, but I'm just saying uh, the power of God not being displayed, right? It's very natural, and everything comes down to just what you do and how hard you work and that kind of stuff. Then you got the other end of the spectrum where everything is spiritual. Everything is supernatural. Everything is this. And if it's not supernatural, it's not God. You know, if it's not some spectacular thing, it's not God. And you got these two ends of the spectrum. Now, the problem is, it, the, usually the people that are on the end of the spectrum says, oh, power. God's power, uh, healings, uh, supernatural. Because they can't produce power, they get weird and get super spiritual to the point where they, they have a false spirituality. And then sometimes they start getting to the point, well, you know, I see this. Oh, I see that going on and these things. And most of it is they begin, and many times they even do what the Bible says not to do. And actually the Bible, it doesn't make fun of it, but it tells, you know, it makes it, puts it down. And that is that they begin to prophesy out of the vanity of their mind. And so that takes place because they can't produce power. Then you got the other side that really doesn't, believe much in power displays, they might believe that, you know, God empowers them to witness, meaning hopefully they can win an argument or, you know, convert somebody or something. And that's how they sit. So you got these two. Now, if you could ever get the people who, it, well, you get the people that have the um, more the natural viewpoint. Okay, obviously they're cutting out a lot of the spiritual power of God. But then you got the people that are super spiritual that think everything is this, and they don't plan. They think, oh, I'm being led by the Spirit. I'm being led. I'm just going to wait and be led. I'm going to be moved. And everything is wispy, and you can't put your finger on anything. 
if you could, and, and the thing is, when, for instance, myself, okay, when I was raised amongst, mostly among the Baptist church, we visited uh, the Pentecostal church, you know, pretty regular. My mom was more Pentecostal than Baptist. My dad was raised Methodist and Nazarene, so we went to some of those churches, but mainly settled in the Baptist church because my dad was a police officer, and that was the social church to go to. Uh, so he had all these things going on, and so we would go there, but as we would be, uh, you know, in the, in the Baptist church, I mean, I went through, uh, even as a young teenager, I went through witnessing classes and seminars where they taught us how to witness, and then we went out on the streets and witnessed, and we didn't do that in the Pentecostal church. Everything was inside, and everything was based on how high he could jump and, you know, how fast he could run and all that kind of stuff, you know? So we, we weren't being taught how to witness. We weren't being taught how to pray for anybody because mostly they had the idea of, well, just, you know, God's going to do it if he wants to. We're going to pray and yell and shout and maybe, you know, used to, is what we used to call shotgun prayers. You just shoot out there and see if something hits. And, you know, and if something sticks, it's like throwing mud on a wall to see what actually sticks there. Uh, so, you know, and hopefully if something happened, then we try to go back and say, okay, well, who threw that last mud against the wall? Because what it was, you did it and it worked. So let's do what you do. So, but in the, the sad part was when I was coming up in the Baptist church, man, I wanted, I believed in power. I believed in healing. And my mom told me, you know, God healed you when you were a child. He's done this and he's done that and all these different things. And we saw what he did when my dad would get shot. My dad was shot once. He was uh, hit with a tire iron once uh, in the back of the head. Uh, put a couple of cars in a canal 30 foot down, full uniform in the middle of winter, almost froze to death, had to swim to the top and, and was laid out in the, in the middle of the road. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And every time that would happen, before the police would call us, you know, telling us what had happened, my mom would be awake and come wake me up and say, Curry, we got to pray for your dad. Something's happened. Every time. So by the time the police called us, we were already awake. And pretty, usually, matter of fact, after about the first or second time, by the time the police called us, we were already dressed, ready to go. And they'd say, we're sitting in the car. We'd say, we're ready. And, and so they would, they, you know, it got to be a normal, unfortunately, a normal thing uh, that we would go through. But as I was growing up, I wanted, you know, we, we didn't know how to operate in power but we just kind of prayed and, you know, God do something. But we were very good at planning in the Baptist church. When we planned out campaigns and crusades and everything else. And I mean, we, we planned these things and making sure that everybody's witnessing. We just had no power to back it up. And then you find out, you know, you come over here and you find out, oh, there's power. And here's what you need. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking to the tongues and gifts and these things. And you get that. And all of a sudden you quit going out, you quit witnessing and everything's in the church. So it's the people that don't have power that are doing more on the street. And then when you get the power that's supposed to help you do the stuff on the street, you quit going on the street. So the key was we had to learn. Now, the problem is now in the church, many circles, in charismatic circles especially, there's all kinds of spiritual stuff, but nothing outside the church. And they don't plan. No, they think planning is, you know, against the spirit. Well, you're going to plan the spirit out of things and you got to just be able to flow it. No, God had a plan. He had a plan, you realize, he had a plan before the foundation of the earth. That means he had a plan. He, he had a blueprint in his mind of exactly the way this thing was going to look, the, the solar system and the order of it all. I mean, he's a very organized and orderly God. And so he doesn't mind you planning. Now, we don't want to plan the Holy Spirit out of things. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit can work within our plans if our goal is to glorify God. And so the real key is to get these two things together and get you planning. Now, this is the principle of the objective. You can plan and plan the power of the Holy Spirit into the plans and expect his power to be in the plans you're doing. Amen? Do you get that? Okay. Now, so we don't want to just float around. We have to have an objective. We have to know what we're doing while we're here. If, if we, and you can have a long-term goal or an overall goal, which will be the Great Commission. And then you can have short-term goals, which is how you fulfill the Great Commission. And then you have to have goals to teach you how and train you how to fulfill the Great Commission. So all these are step-by-step -step plans and goals that you can have. Now, the, yeah, the principle of objective is applicable at all levels of operations. Goals of smaller units are frequently altered in campaigns or wars, but seldom in the midst of battle. You got that? They may be altered, you know. But very seldom right in the middle of a battle are they going to change things. Why? Because you fight the way you train. So you need to train the way you want to fight. Most Christians don't do that. Amen. Right? Now, so the objective must have all five qualities for attainment. Which is what? Number one, it must be clear. 
the objective must be clear. The objective must be absolutely clear to all those who are expected to be instrumental in attaining it. Now this is, you know, the only exception to this, not totally an exception, uh, but if you study the campaigns of, as I mentioned yesterday, Stonewall Jackson, he was known for keeping his plans secret, even from some of his field commanders, to the point where they didn't know what he was going to do until the very moment whenever he would send by letter, uh, you know, a writer to go over and tell them, here's what I want you to do. And that's when they would know about it. And so in many cases, it was that element of surprise which allowed him to win. But now notice the surprise was only to the people that didn't need to know until they needed to know. Now that comes down to us. Many Christians, God tells them to do something. They think about doing it. They're looking at it. They want to do it. And then they want to tell everybody. And all of a sudden the enemy knows exactly what they're going to do. And so he does everything he can to make sure it doesn't happen. Okay? I, I could give you personal example. I mean, example after example of times where we're looking at certain things, me personally, looking at certain things, going certain places, doing certain things a certain way. And if I talk about it, the enemy sets up things to try to stop it from happening. If I don't talk about it and I just surprise it, then it happens without, uh, you know, being interrupted. But the problem is uh, you've got different kinds of people. You've got people that can be spontaneous and you've got people that when they're, as soon as you go spontaneous, they just shut down. And they don't know what to do next because they just don't know how to be spontaneous on it. And so many times, uh, you know, they get, the minute you tell them, all of a sudden they dig in and they become the, the blockage because they don't like the idea of spontaneity. And so we have to learn who to talk to, who not to talk to, and who to include on certain things and who not to include. And so you don't have to tell everything. Some things you need to keep secret until the time to let them be known. Now, uh, next, okay, number two, the goal, the, the objective must be attainable, okay? The objective must be realistic. Now, the good thing about this is that with us, with faith, all things are possible. So realistic means, can I believe God? Can I truly trust God? Can I believe God for this thing to happen, right? And if you can't, it's not realistic. Now, if you can, it is realistic, regardless of how ridiculous it may sound to other people. If you can trust God, it's realistic, right? So, uh, it must be realistic and within the capability of the unit assigned to attain it. If it is not, it must be further defined and pared down until it fits these requirements. Turn it into three different objectives, right? Going after each one in turn. In other words, if the, if the overall goal is too big, in the sense that, okay, you're, you're, God gave it to you, you believe it's attainable, you say, I can trust God, this is going to happen. Then you say, okay, you tell somebody, you tell the group that's, gonna, that's supposed to do it, and all of a sudden they panic and say, oh, this is too big, we can't do this. Then at that point, you say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You, break, you have it already broken down into three parts. You say, here's what you need to do. Can you do that? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, and then you have them do that part, and they move from part to part. Now, one of the things... Uh, the next one, number three, it must be decisive. It does no good to have an objective that doesn't accomplish anything. So there needs to be a decisive aspect to the objective. The objective must be significant and meaningful and must make a worthwhile contribution to the achievement of higher order objectives. In other words, whatever you're doing, it should be leading and helping achieve the greater objectives that you've already set. Right now. Resources should not be risked for objectives that are not worth the expense. Objectives must fan the passion of the soldiers. In other words, you've got to find what sets people on fire, right? And so usually we know what that means. Whatever it is, make it bigger. Because usually small, small goals don't inspire passion, right? Uh, it was not a small goal when John Kennedy said, we will put a man on the moon this decade. That was a huge thing, right? And guess what? They did it. Why? Because people like to be challenged. If you look around at the greatest trends right now in the world, they are all trends pushing for the extreme challenge of people. What the, the greatest, what are the uh, biggest health uh, challenges uh, or biggest uh, trends, I should say, is CrossFit. And CrossFit pushes people to their individual max using uh, a, a group 
you know, scenario or group workout, but they're pushing everybody to their individual, uh, you know, best, uh, personal best, we should say. And so, but why? Because the people today, especially the youth, want to be pushed. They want to be challenged. That's why the church has lost so many youth. The church doesn't challenge anybody. That's why the Mormons grow the way they do. Why? Because they challenge their youth. Years ago, I was riding on a, or I was on a plane, and I picked up a magazine, and they were interviewing the, basically the chief apostle, as he, called, as he was called, for the Mormon church. And one of the questions was, how do you, because it's over 85% uh, of their youth go on mission for two years. And they said, this man said, how do you do that? He said, most churches can't even get their kids to go to summer camp let alone devoting their life, two years of their life, at the prime of their life, to not go to college, but instead go to, you know, get out of high school and go uh, on a mission field, mission trip for two years. How do you do that? And the answer was amazing. This uh, guy said, uh, we expect it of them. They expect it. In other words, it's, it's not even a matter of, are you going to do this? They expect, this, this is the path. This is what you're going to do. And everything from the, from the time they're children growing up, this is expected of them, and they all know what's expected and where they're going. So by the time they turn 18 and ready to go, there's not even a question about it, for the most part. And so, and, and as I was reading that, I was thinking, man, if the Christian church would ever realize that and start expecting their kids to go to the mission field for two years. You know, people, look at Israel. Every Israeli, when they turn 18, they have to go into the military for, for at least two years. And so, and why? Because it's a matter of national survival. Well, maybe we ought to picture it as a, uh, you know, matter of spiritual survival for the church. That our youth go to the mission field for two years somewhere and help either an established thing or help establish a thing, which means they should be trained before they get there. All the, but they have to be challenged. People want a challenge. That's why you have so many people trying out and going through, uh, you know, Navy SEALs, BUDS, uh, you know, the, the selection service, the Green Beret selection um, and assessment courses, what they call the Q course. Uh, I mean, you've got all these different uh, branches, and it's amazing. The special forces never, in any branch, never are at a lack of people who are applying, right? Now, they don't all make it, and there's up to an 85% uh, attrition rate in some of those groups, but nevertheless, they still, ha they have a, a, a good number of people that are attempting it, even though they're told how, how hard it is and how tough it's going to be. And yet, why? Because people want to achieve and they want to be challenged. And yet we've got the greatest challenge there can possibly be. I mean, there, there's nobody that can do what Christians can do other than Christians. Amen. And we need to realize that and start to step out into it and see what God is in. If, you know, I always said maybe someday they'll have a machine that you can strap onto your head. And whenever I talk about some of the things that we've seen, it'll give a picture where people can see it. And, you know, we have some pictures. I've got 44 photo albums in my office, in the shelf, that has between 350 and 425 pictures in each one of them that we have collected over the last 20 years of travel and showing the things, the places we've been, the things we've seen, different healings, different stuff like that. And, you know, people, people don't realize what you have the potential to see if you'll stretch out of your comfort zone. And you don't have to go necessarily overseas to do it, even though going overseas is a really good way to do it. Why? Because when you're over there, you're really focused. Yeah. You know, you, you really, and you're not distracted. Here, here in America, many times during day-to-day -day stuff, you can get distracted because you're living a normal life. You go home to your own house in the evening. When you go, when I go to, to South Africa or Ukraine or anywhere like that, uh, I go back to the hotel room. There, we don't have much there generally. I'm focused. I don't have all of the different things going on. Many people can't reach me by phone. So we have to transfer the phone calls to, to people local, uh, but I'm able to focus. And so it makes for much greater success. And, and all I've been trying to do since then is trying to create those same circumstances here and live like a missionary here rather than wait until I get over there. And when you do, you have greater results. But I'm telling you, it, it's, the whole point is deciding to live a certain kind of life and then move in that direction. Amen? So, as we always say, uh, simplify. Right? So always simplify as much as you can. So, number four, it must be specific. Your objective must be specific. The, objecti the objective should be measurable. It must be expressed in such a way that it will be clear 
whether it has been accomplished or not. Right? A third party should be able to judge whether or not the objective has been attained. In other words, you've got to write it out. What does the Bible say? Write the vision. Make it clear. Make it plain. Why? So he that runs may read it and run. So it has to be clear so that people can tell we've accomplished it or we haven't. Right? Number five, it must be time-bounded. There must be a time limit. This is why it works good. Now, this works very well for short-term goals, but it can also be a long-term goal. But if you're going to do a long-term goal and put a time on it, you definitely need short-term goals that also have time limits so that you can actually... Now, they don't have to be equal amounts. You know, we could say, okay, we got four steps to this vision, and we got a year to do it. Now, you would think automatically, okay, so it's going to be a different step every three months. Not necessarily. In the beginning, the first step might only last one month, or the first step might last six months. Why? To get that first thing done, because starting is usually the hardest part. Then once you get it started, then it can go very quickly, and the, move, the uh, pieces of it can be a lot faster. A, over 80% of all energy that is used at a uh, rocket launch happens at the, within the first few seconds of the launch because it has to break the Earth's gravitational pull. And it's the same thing with most things that you're going to try to achieve uh, for God is that the, it's the start. It's the breaking away from the gravitational pull of society, of the normal situation, normal life, and most of your energy is used at the very beginning because once it gets going, it gets easy. It's the getting going that is usually the toughest. And so, because you have to break through all the naysayers, all the people that don't believe it can be done, you have to shoot down all that stuff and get your head clear and go after it. So all, a lot of your energy is used right at the beginning. And once, honestly, it's the old saying, success breeds success. Once you get it going, it seems to work. You get the momentum behind it. You'll even see that in one of the principles here. So, um, <clears throat> there must be a specific deadline along with timelines for the achievement of the objective. A specific date and time must be given for the attainment of a clear, decisive, and specific objective. Now, here's the thing, okay? And I, I do believe the Holy Spirit just brought this to my attention. Here's the temptation you're going to have to overcome. You are learning these principles. We're going through them. And it's really easy to go principle, 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 okay? And learn them and get information and not do them. So I'm telling you, it's good. We're going to stop on this principle. So when you go wherever you got to go tonight, get there, sit down, start looking at these things, start analyzing. Okay, what is my goal? What is the purpose? You know, what, what, what am I trying to do? What does God have for me? And then start putting it together and ask God. He'll show you things to come. He'll show you what, he, what you need to do step by step, but make a plan. Now listen, remember, planning is everything. Plans are nothing, right? He says, why am I going to waste time doing a plan if it's nothing? Because as you put the plan down, now God knows where you plan to go. And he knows what adjustments he has to make in you because maybe your plan isn't perfect. Amen? And so he, he'll say, okay, that's where they're planning on going. So now uh, that's not where I want them to go. I want them to go 10 degrees to the left. So now he knows what he has to adjust. That's better than letting you go forward. And then when you get down there, having to do a hard 90 degree left turn to get you on the right track. Right? 